This is just one section from the book Modern Problems by Sir Oliver Lodge, published in 1902. The Question of Reality The question, does time exist, is a legitimate one. For time is an inference which may or may not correspond with reality. The question, does matter exist, is another legitimate question, and one that has often been asked. I should answer both questions in the affirmative and should plead that these ancient and universal inferences should be trusted. They originate as abstract ideas, but they correspond to concrete reality. They are not directly apprehended, but they are apprehended, and they are real. In the first place, any question as to the reality of motion is absurd. It is part of our own existence and cannot be questioned, save by a comprehensive skepticism which overwhelms everything and nullifies itself. For in that case, there is no one to be skeptical and nothing to be skeptical about. Space is primarily an abstraction dependent on our perception of continued motion. And that abstraction alone, geometry may be based. But if we conceive space to be a reality, as we do, we may proceed to investigate its other properties, beside extension, and may find it, by aid of physics, to be substantial and may endow it with the properties of an ether, which, for all we know, is coextensive with it. Matter is primarily an abstraction or mental concept invented to account for or to summarize conveniently our consistent apprehension of localized resistance. But as soon as we conceive of matter as a reality, we proceed to investigate its other properties and thus create the science of chemistry and a portion of the science of physics. The hypothesis that matter is real is pragmatically justified. So it is also with time. Time is primarily an abstraction devised so that in combination with space, we may formulate our direct experience of varying degrees of rapidity of motion. Every kind of clock is a moving body, and every steadily moving body will serve as a clock. Our apprehension of time is derived from motion and space. Motion is not derived from space and time, though its artificial measurement may be expressed in their terms. The units of time are manifestly and obviously artificial. It is not given to us in seconds or in any other discontinuous and countable units. It is a continuum, like space, and though we break up into thens and whens, the eternal now, we do it in the same way and for the same sort of reason as we subdivide a yard measure or place milestones on the Dover Road. We apprehend time instant by instant, but we conceive it as a uniformly flowing entity, as something which flows past us or at the moments of which we arrive, precisely as we might apprehend the divisions and interspaces on a yard measure drawn past us, if we could see them only one at a time, all the rest being hidden from us and being past only or future. A microscopist does in truth thus study the structure of a solid, dividing it into an orderly succession of slices by his microtome and studying them one after the other. Thus, has originated the idea 
of a fourth dimension through which we are traveling and apprehending only in sections, each section as it arrives being called the present. In this analogy, change and sequence are modes of apprehension rather than ultimate realities. They are subjective aspects of a universe itself unchanging. But sooner or later the analogy breaks down, like all other analogies. The microscopist knows that the sections he has not yet cut are already predetermined. That the structure he is studying is really there and that he has only to ascertain it. We do not know that it is so with the process we call time or with the thing we call the future. Here come in all the puzzles, to us apparently real and legitimate puzzles, about fixed fate, foreknowledge, and free will, and I am not going to tackle them too closely. There is no compulsion to press the dimensional analogy or any other analogy unduly. In slicing through a solid, we know that its anterior or perhaps we should say posterior portion already exists. In slicing through our hypothetical fourth dimension, we do not know how far or in what sense the future already exists, or how far it is affected by what we are doing now. Perhaps we are introducing something into it at every slice. If evolution and progress are realities, and not dreams, it may be that the future is conditioned by the past. Even though the future may in some sort already exist, it may be waiting for the sap, the lifeblood, the vivifying pabulum which will convert it into the present. Pabulum which the past has prepared and which the present is conveying into its veins, so that its real and vital significance may be modified and readapted and controlled by the activities which are now going on. The future of the tree before me will not be unmodified according as I do or do not take a knife and slash into its bark. Self-determining beings may exist and as part of the controlling and determining agency of the universe may create works that are new and may intrude into the future conditions which would otherwise not be there. So also the future may be full of self-determination, actuated and influenced in part by what is occurring here and now. It is for us to ascertain and find out the truth, not to be satisfied with a priori assumptions of impossibility. Our conceptions of the possible need training and widening. Strange indeed if this should be contested. Another useful analogy can be drawn from the loom of a weaver. Each thread is laid down in the present. The woven pattern is the past. The determining cards are the future. It all represents a plan, but the plan is prehistoric is outside the scheme, is something inconceivable to the loom and to the flying shuttle, even to the working weaver perhaps. This analog also depicts, it is true, a determined universe. The universe of Omar Khayyam. But no analogy coerces. A loom may be imagined or even constructed otherwise. It would be feasible to arrange so that each thread as it arrived, either by its contact with the thread preceding, or by the way it enters, or by its tautness or slackness, or by its electric properties, that each thread should itself affect the pattern determining cards, should modify the arrangement, should introduce fresh conditions. After the haphazard manner of a kaleidoscope, this could be done if desired and should thus assist in determining the resulting, the future, pattern. Even by machinery this could be managed, 
And if the future, instead of being a mere mechanical entity arriving in due preordained sequence, is itself composed of or dominated by living intelligence, if the sections as they arrive are the result of what is even now being prepared in the future, which is beyond our ken, then there may be reason to suppose that that future may be modified by what is occurring here and now, and that active living and loving intelligences which dominate it may be influenced by our longing, by our exertion, by our prayers. There is no absurdity or contradiction in the idea. It is a question of fact. It is a legitimate subject for investigation. And the past also. It is not non-existent. It does not succumb immediately to the devouring tooth of time. It is the region of achievement. In the luminology, the past is the pattern for which the machine exists, for which the labor is undertaken. It is the finished work. Insofar as it is a work of art, the labor was worthwhile. And our works of art, which seem to be perishing, may have an immortality of their own, akin to the immortality of poetry. The characters of Shakespeare are not dead and cannot die. They have not lived a mortal life. They are essentially immortal. Nor is the creator really likely to be more evanescent than his work. These things are in eternity. They are out of time. They subsist forever. All the greatest things are of this nature and are free from the limitations of time. For time is a limitation, an ordered and constraining sequence, though nevertheless real. Perhaps absolutely real and essential, certainly subjectively real, and appertaining to the human aspect of the universe. So that time, originally arrived at by us as an abstraction like space and matter, may, like them also, put on the aspect of reality and may exhibit in itself properties, properties far from simple or obvious, which we may rightly investigate and try to understand. The law of evolution is one of the formulated attempts to understand the nature of time and if time is in truth a fundamental reality, as I conceive matter and space also to be, though they are none of them fundamental or primary modes of perception, then we may seek to apprehend and formulate the various bearings of the idea of evolution in ways clearer and more thorough than have yet been attempted. The hypothesis is worth making just as the hypothesis of the real existence of matter has been worth making. It has been justified by its fruits. It has worked, as the pragmatist says, and this other hypothesis, that time is a real and not a hallucinatory progress, may work too. Nevertheless, though we may maintain that the succession of events, the facts of growth and change, are not hallucinatory, that they are real enough, we cannot safely assert that they are so real as to be eternal. There are facts which suggest that there is a higher kind of existence, an existence already attained by our loftiest work, an existence appropriate to creations of genius. A kind of existence, or subsistence, or super subsistence, which transcends present limitations, which has been raised or put ashore out of the current of the time stream into a freer and diviner air, where the past, the present, and the future are united in the transcendental coexistence of a more copious reality. The aim even of a human artist is to produce work which shall be thus transcendent and immortal. And the creator need not be supposed subject to human limitations, 
but we are now entering on theology, and I refrain. Let me repeat that if we owe all original knowledge to our primary existence and fundamental sensations, we must have arrived at our conceptions of the universe, of space and time and matter, of other intelligences, of the deity, and of real and progressive existence by utilization and development of notions derived from our primary and direct sense perceptions of motion, of speed, and of force.